them the first couple of times, man, watching them, it's like, <laughs> it's like a comedy show. Uh, we had one dude, he was brand new, PFC. We were on land and this, this, he got sick. And I was like, look, dude, like if you're gonna puke, it's gotta be in your Kevlar. Like you're not puking on the deck. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So he's sitting there like for the ride, just Kevlar in his hand, yeah. just Kevlar in his face, ready to puke. Zack Snyder, branch of service, Marine Corps. Been in for a little over five years now, rank of sergeant. Got a couple more years to go, but. So I'm from Pennsylvania. Had a, had a pretty good upbringing. Uh, never had really any issues. Growing up, my dad was law enforcement, uh, and then both my brothers went law enforcement. Uh, my middle brother ended up going Army National Guard uh, before he went law enforcement. So that was kind of where I started getting like my first taste of like the military and like seeing it a little bit. Obviously, he was just Army National Guard, so I give him, give him a lot of shit for it. When I was, I don't even remember how old I was, but I was at school and I remember seeing like a lot of cops going by, all that, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, like what's going on? And I got home and my dad wasn't home. And I was like, this is kind of weird, right? Like I knew he should have been off by now. He was off like an hour ago, would have been home. And like, I could just see on my mom's face, like something, something was wrong. And I was like, oh man, like what, what could this be? So my dad had ended up getting in a shootout that day. They went to serve an arrest warrant. Dude ended up shooting at him. It was just him and another officer. Freaking dude ended up taking his own life, but you know, it was a whole day ordeal, all that. So pretty scary, uh, at least for me and my brothers, cause up until that point, you know, he's a cop in a small town, never really had that kind of experience. Once that happened though, we were like, oh man, like this is real. Like these are the real things that can happen. Um, and that was kind of like the turning point for me of where I was like, okay, like I want to do something like in my life, like to fulfill that. Like I felt like I had to, almost like fill his shoes, you know, like I wanted to, wanted to make him proud. And then my brother had joined the Army National Guard. And that's when I was like, I think that's what I'm going to do is the military. Army seems easy, right? Like there's no way I could ever make it in the Marine Corps. My brother was supposed to go to Afghanistan. They were going to go replace like two artillery units over there. Coming down to the wire, they were getting ready to go. We were kind of like experiencing all that pre-deployment stuff, you know, getting a, having a family member getting ready to leave isn't easy. Um, and then it ended up getting kanked. So I was like, oh, wow, like that's, that's, that's good for us. But that was definitely when I was like, okay, yeah, like military is what I want to do 100%. Coming out of high school, going into senior year, uh, I was like, man, I don't know what branch I want to do. <laughs> uh, I was like, I think I'm going to go Air Force. So started talking to the Air Force recruiter and he gave me this like 30 page packet of health questions. And it was like, each page was like the same question, but worded differently. I got through like three pages, push it off to the side of the desk in my room. I was like, I'm not joining the Air Force. Like, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not filling out this packet. I had two buddies that had just went in the Marine Corps. So they got me talking to the recruiter and I was like, you know, what kind of paperwork is it? And he was like, I can have you enlisted like next week. And I was like, that's the easiest one. We're going for it. It took some convincing from them because obviously up until that point, like I was like, you know, I don't know if I can do the Marine Corps because, you know, everyone's always like, hey, the Marine Corps is like so hard, like you know, they're, they're bad asses, like all that stuff. So I was like, man, I don't know if I can do it. They convinced me. So I did it. I uh, ended up going to boot camp like 2017. It was weird. I was very scared to join, even though I wanted to, like, that was like what I wanted to do for sure. I almost knew I had to join because I had some anger issues growing up. And it was like, I knew if I didn't join, like I wasn't, I wasn't going to be successful. I wasn't good with school. So I knew I wasn't going to make it in college. My parents never forced it on me to join. Uh, but I'm pretty sure they're, they're glad I did. Cause I think they probably saw the same thing. Like I needed something to get me under control. So I told him, I was like, look, I was like, I don't want to go infantry, but I was like, I don't want to be behind a desk. Like, I was like, I want to do something like, like something in support of infantry, like something along those lines. And he was like, all right, well, I got this, this category right here, combat support. I was like, okay, what's that? And he like explained it. So it had field artillery tanks uh, AAVs and then uh lad gunner, you know, I'd wanted field artillery. My brother did field artillery. So I was like, yeah, man, like let's, can I get field artillery? And you know how some recruiters are. So he was like, yeah, yeah, I got you field artillery. So from that point on, like I was thinking field artillery, little did I know he just put me as combat support. I go to boot camp MCT and I knew where field artillery school was. It was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Cause I'd went there to see my brother graduate. 
So I was like, I know if my orders say Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I'm going to be artillery. And my thing said 18XX Camp Pendleton, California. And I was like, what in the world is this? I hadn't even looked at what AAVs were. I didn't care about them. Like I didn't look at tanks. Like I was like, I'm going field artillery. I was like, hey, whatever. Like I get to go to California though. Leave MCT, go to California, show up. And I'm like, what in the world are these things, man? Like see them for the first time. And I'm like, whoa, like this is, this is crazy. But it was like, I was like, damn, this is kind of cool. Like screw field artillery. Like I'm glad I'm here now. Yeah. Like, th these look, these look freaking badass. So mm -hmm. we have like a little boat basin right there. Mm -hmm. So that's where we would first drive. Uh, and then we would go out to the ocean. But yeah, man, like trying to control it through the surf zone as a brand new student, you know, you got some sergeant behind you, like he's yelling at you as you're trying to go. And you're like, oh man, like, what do I do? And, uh, it's butt buggering. Yeah. Until, until you get like through the surf zone, you're actually in the water a little bit. And then you come out after that first time and you're like, oh, like that's, that's fine. Like I want to do it again. That was actually really cool. But that first time splashing in, you're like, I don't know how this is going to end, but I hope it's a good way. <laughs> For my first deployment, we were with three, five. We had the same dudes pretty much all the time on the same vehicles. So we got really close with those dudes on the vehicles, but some of them, man, it was just so funny because we're used to riding on them land and water. So like you get, you get used to it. Them the first couple of times, man, watching them, it's like, <laughs> it's like a comedy show. Uh, we had one dude, he was, he was brand new PFC. We were on land and this, this, he got sick and uh, he was in the back of my vehicle. And I was like, look, dude, like if you're going to puke, it's got to be in your Kevlar. Like you're not puking on the deck. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. So he's sitting there like for the ride, just Kevlar in his hand, yeah. just Kevlar in his face, ready to puke. So I came from the schoolhouse and then I got stationed at third tracks in Camp Pendleton. So literally right across the street. Um, I ended up being honor grad of my class, which is no big deal at all. Really just means I just asked a lot of questions on every test and <laughs> that's, that's what got me it. So I graduated and because I was an honor grad, they sent me to a MU platoon. So the 15th MU had just gotten back and then they had just disbanded. So like we had probably like five or six corporals and that was about it, five or six Lance corporals. So I'd hit the fleet to them. The NCOs there were pretty laid back and I got to learn a lot because of it when we were driving, all that stuff. I mean, within my first two weeks, we had a ship op to go qualify the Navy for ground guiding us. So they had me drive in and then my platoon sergeant rode on my vehicle and then my crew chief and he had my crew chief be quiet. And he was like, let's see how he does. I ended up pushing out, getting on the ship, getting us off the ship and coming back all my own, got us there, got us back, all good. Which ended up getting me sent to the 11th new platoon and they were just forming. So that was where it really started to get like real. So like I hit the fleet and I didn't get that real like experience right away of like hitting the fleet. I got it when I went to the 11th Mu platoon. And that was like a 180 from what I just experienced. First day in, we were doing a freaking Indian run to the O course. And we did like the O course like six or seven times. And because I was a new dude, I had uh, one corporal. He's out now. That dude used to always mess me up, man. Like I was like his target. After a certain point, it got to be like almost fun. Yeah. But at first it's like, dude, this guy is on my ass. Like, why is this guy hounding me? Like I've done nothing to draw attention to myself. Like, but this guy is hounding me. So an Indian run is like, you have two, two rows of people uh, and you guys are running. So you start with the ammo can in the front, pass the ammo can back between the people. So you have the two rows and you just pass it back. And then once it gets to that guy in the back, he sprints up around everyone else to the front. And then you start passing that ammo can back again. And then once it gets to that back guy, he's sprinting up to the front again. I had a platoon sergeant. I, I won't name him because he's still in as well. That guy was a beast, man. Like first day PT with the platoon and this man, I see him and he's wearing a gas mask for this Indian run in the O course. And I'm like, what the hell? And this guy's beating the whole platoon. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like this guy's going to be dangerous. Uh, he ended up being my section leader probably one of like the best freaking staff NCOs I've ever had in the Marine Corps so far. It's crazy to look back on because you see how much a platoon really like forms to one. When I got there, it was like, you know, everyone's individuals. It's like going to boot camp again, but like on a lesser scale. Once we got like halfway through the workup and towards the end, like the cohesion is just insane. That was like the best thing I remember from the workup cycle is just how that cohesion formed.
because like it doesn't matter who you are what you do like everyone's just tight getting on towards like the end of the workup is when we started to do like more ship ops kind of get ready for that uh, and then once we got on ship man it's like life is completely different so we were on the harper's ferry so we were on the small deck of the arg when we left the the day of for deployment all your families are there we splash into the the boat basin and then we push out the ship so it's like you're getting your final waves goodbye from your family and it's like the first couple of days it's kind of surreal like it doesn't really hit and then like that second week you're like oh man like this is real like we're on this thing for a little bit you don't have much to do so it's like work out eat chow work and sleep and that's about it man the uh i was always jealous of the grunts on there because they were always freaking living it up man they go eat chow go work out maybe do a couple gun drills and they were done for the day you know we're going down in the well deck where it's like 110 plus stagnant hot air working on the vehicles we're like damn dude all we want to do is be done but then after that it's like you don't have anything else to do so you're either watching movies or working out again you get really close with everyone you live in a little six pack of racks in the in the birthing you know those six dudes you get close so we made uh our own gym pretty much for all of the Marines. So in the well deck, they had like a little area below it for storage and they had one open. So throughout the workup cycle, people brought equipment on. They had mats down there, wrestling mats. They had weights, all kinds of stuff. So we go down there, do McNabb, work out. A lot of times, like if we weren't doing that, we were probably all watching movies together in the birthing or we were up in the mess deck and they'd hook up like a, like a Nintendo Switch or something to the TV and they'd be running like tournaments just to keep people busy. All the Liberal ports, man, all crazy. The uh, the best one, though, is uh, Dukum, Dukum Oman. So we get there. We are supposed to go to uh, Muscat, Oman. So more of a tourist area. There's an embassy there. Way more populated. We get to Dukum, and Dukum is, like, trying to turn into the next Dubai, apparently. And uh, so, I mean, it's nothing. It's just desert and, like, a few buildings here and there. They had a little area on the port for us. And it was just uh, shipping containers, like cargo containers, stacked too high around, and that was like our security wall. And then they brought in a bunch of uh, local vendors for food, beer, all that kind of stuff. They had one that always cracked me up. It was called DFC. It was Dukem Fried Chicken. Shit always cracked me up, man. Uh, but they had like, the vendors they brought in, they had like a Pizza Hut, stuff like that. Uh, and then there was two hotels we were allowed to go to, but that was the one place we weren't allowed to stay overnight. So we would go to these hotels for the day. You know, I'm 19 at the time. So, of course, we're on the Libo port. Like, I'm going to drink. They don't card you there. They don't care. So we're drinking. I drank, like, three beers, I think. And then my buddy that I went out with, he was getting kind of wild. So I was like, I'm, I'm just going to I'm gonna chill a little bit and kind of take care of him, make sure he gets back with me. <laughs> I get him back to the ship, and he starts puking in the, in the birthing. He eventually starts puking blood. So we're like, oh, shit, like, something's wrong but it was just from him puking so much. He goes and lays in his bed, and then this one kid, he goes and gets him up from the bed, and he's like, hey, like, you need to come stand by these garbage bags. Like, if you need to puke, you need to puke. I don't want you choking on it. And then this other guy's getting pissed because this drunk guy's out of bed standing by the garbage bags. So they start arguing. The one guy's like, no, send him to bed. The other guy's saying, no, he needs to stand up and puke or he's gonna choke on it. They start fighting. Like, it just turns into fucking one shoves the other, and then hands are just getting thrown, banging heads off the deck, like punching each other. The next day they look like they got stung by like 10 bees in their face. I'm trying to sleep. So I get out of my rack and I'm like, I'm gonna try to break this fight up. Uh, but a little bit beforehand, one of our other boys, I was kind of a dickhead to him and he was talking shit and I pulled rank on him and I had like just picked up. So we were, we were both literally just Lance Corporals together for the whole workup, like majority of the deployment. And as soon as I did it, I was like, damn, that was kind of messed up. When I broke up this fight, it was like his opportunity to get get his hit on, hit on me. And uh, I went down and I grabbed this dude by the neck and I'm like pulling him up. And I'm still bent over and as soon as I look up, man, his fist just connects with my face. And I was like, oh shit, like what the hell? Like, what did I just get hit by? I mean, he was a scrapper, so he knew how to fight. He knew where to hit and he connected good. And I was like, man, fuck this. Like I'm getting in my bed. I roll over and my one boy is like, hey, your face is bleeding. I was like, no, it's not. And I wipe my face and I look at my hand and I was like, oh, my hand's covered in blood. I was like, damn, he really did bust me. I go into the head, wipe my face off. And of course, this is the one time, like all the staff and enlisted live separately. 
but my section leader was coming back from the gym at the time. So he stopped in our head. And of course, this one moment that I don't want any staff NCO to be around is right when he's in there when I'm in there washing my face off. She was like, hey, what happened? And I just told him, I was like, oh, I fell. Like, you know, slipped, busted my face off a, off a cubby. He saw right through that. So he went into the squad bay and they're fighting. I can't confirm or deny if he let him fight him out, fight it out or not, but <laughs> you, you know how that goes. So he yeah. sent me to medical. And Doc was like, yeah, man, we'll just we'll just put some glue on it and send you about your way, right? Like, everything's good. There's this female, she was about to pick up Chief, and she came in and was like, oh, my God, like, you need sutures. Like, we need to call your chain of command. Like, who's your first sergeant? Who's your platoon sergeant? Like, we need to call all of them. Like, you need stitches. Like, I know at this point, like, I'm going to get screwed somehow. Like, I was underage drinking. Like, somehow, some way, something's going to come out. Well, my platoon sergeant comes down with the first sergeant and he covered for me as well. He was like, oh no, first sergeant, he's 21, he's good. He hasn't been drinking, he was taking care of the other dude, which is semi-true. Other than the fact that I was 19 and I definitely had some drinks, which that ended up coming out anyway. So I get stitches put in my face, I go back in, they're done fighting. Next day we wake up and it's like, their faces are puffy. So uh, we all get caught up to the CO's little like office up, up on the top of the ship and uh, get put on libo restriction. So there's like different classes for restriction and uh, they put us on class B. So it was just like, we had to go out with someone who was a rank above us and just be back by a certain time. So as a corporal at the time, I just had to go out with a sergeant. I had to be back at a certain time. No big deal, no sweat. I was like, you know, kind of deserved it. And the first sergeant started talking to us after our CO left. And he was like, you know, you guys are freaking, your cohesion is awesome. Like I want the, I want our grunts to be like you guys, like your platoon, you know, you guys got it going for you. He was like, you know, don't fight each other. You know, he was like, obviously it's a bunch of males on the ship. There's a lot of testosterone. He was like, you know, we got CLB on the ship. He was like, we got CLB 11. He was like, go, go fight them instead. Mm. So it was one of those things where we're like, oh, hell yeah. Like, thanks for starting, like hooked it up right there. Stopped at Hawaii first, hit Hawaii up. Just dropped the ground off for some training. Moved to Guam. Guam was just a libo port. We went to Djibouti, Africa for a day and I was like, the hottest hell I've ever been to. I think we had like 20 plus heat cases by the time we got back on ship, dropping left and right. We literally carried like big igloos full of just ice in each vehicle, just because we knew there were gonna be that many heat cases. Didn't really do much there. We did some water gunnery, but wasn't anything crazy. We had went to Brunei a little bit, uh, trained like with the Brunei Army. Army. They were pr some pretty cool dudes. Our biggest one, longest one, we went to Jordan. Uh, we were there for, we were supposed to be there for a week. When we were supposed to leave from that week, we had packed everything up, gotten all the vehicles ready to leave. Five minutes afterwards, they were like, hey, we're staying for another week. And they're like, hey, we'll set, we'll set everything up tomorrow morning again. Like for now, just go to sleep. Like sucks to suck, but get bent. And we're like, huh, all right, like this is awesome. And then of course in Jordan, we had the freaking Hilo dudes. So Kilo company coming in and they would train for like 30 minutes and then leave and go back to ship. They were all like complaining that they missed chow and we're like, dude, mm. we're literally sitting out here in this hot ass desert and you're complaining because you missed chow. But that one, that was really cool there we had. So we got to train with the Jordanians, Saudi Arabians and the Italians and do a big thing. The locals uh, at first really weren't bad. We just called them like the little like Haji trucks, like the little white beater trucks, white Toyotas that they drove around. Uh, and they would come and like pick up our brass from our ranges. And it could be, it could have been anyone doing it. Like we got briefed beforehand, like, hey, you know, some of these dudes are just civilians trying to get this stuff and sell it back to the government to make money for their family. And some of these dudes are are some bad people getting it and, and using it possibly against us at some point. The whole mentality though, while we were there was just, we're there, for, we're there to train. Uh, the only dudes who ever had like ammo were the dudes on watch. First night, dude comes right up behind one of our tracks and the, uh, the guardian angel, as we called him, dude on ammo watch, he was a machine gunner, just a big, big dude. And I mean, he came up and right to this dude's head with his rifle and was like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? Like, get, get out of here. Uh, and that guy turned around pretty quick and left. You know, everyone was like, hey, good job. Like, got him out of here. As we stayed, it was more into that second week where they got really uncomfortable with us being there. They had one night close to us leaving there was a bunch of them outside of our little fob that we made like they hated us they started despising us 
were chasing their white trucks off because they're coming too close to our Marines. Like they really pushed their limits and they knew how far they could go. And they always, always pushed that, that, that boundary. They would drive their trucks like straight up to us. We had one where our CO ended up like ripping the keys out of this guy's truck. Another truck's doing donuts around Marines. Like we sent a vehicle to chase them off. Like they just really didn't, they gave no cares. They did not want us there. And they would set up little fobs. <laughs> Again, we called them Haji fobs because it was like, look at them over there. And they would just watch us from a distance. And it was like, they were always tracking our every move. Some people were fine. You'd pull your MVGs down, not really a care in the world. Other times you'd pull your MVGs down, they'd cover their face, be like, no picture, no picture. Whether that's religious reasons or other reasons, uh, wasn't ever really made clear to us, but it was definitely like, okay, some of these dudes are definitely kind of sketchy. One night, me and my boy were on watch on one end of the road. And then down the road a little bit, we had two other guys, two of the grunts on watch down there. And we're just walk we're walking and we had like these three dudes come up to us from their truck. We kick them back, like we tell them to get away. They got away pretty quick. And I turn around and I see like 30 people like lying down this hill. And I'm like, dude, do we have, like there's no way we have Marines police calling right now. Like everyone's asleep. Like what are these 30 bodies? And then you can just hear like the jingling of like the brass in their pockets. Like you could, you knew they were running and they were running towards us. And I was like, oh, what the hell? So I grab my, I grab a chem stick I had and I crack it and throw it so I can like kind of see a little bit. And this one dude is booking it like straight towards me. And like, if people watching have ever seen the movie Get Out, guy books it right at him and then right in front of him books it hard left. So this guy's running at me and all I can do is just grab my rifle. Like I'm like, I, that's the one thing I don't want to get like hit by this dude and lose my rifle. So I just grab my rifle and like clench on. I'm like, okay. And like right in front of me, like five feet in front of me, he books it left. I was like, okay, cool. Like dude's out of my way. And those 30 dudes like all kind of run away. And I'm like, dude, what the hell? Like at this point, we had never seen that many show up to like an area we've been at. It's normally like a handful of people at a time. So like 30 plus dudes, I was like, wow, this is insane. So they all leave and these three dudes come back. And at this point is when it like kind of clicked, like these three dudes were like almost like in charge of the rest of them. Because when those three dudes came back, they were like yelling at all the, that big group of them. And then they kind of started like picking up brass farther away. So these three guys are walking straight towards us. I crack my other chem stick, throw it at them. You know, we're yelling everything like, get away, get away, like turn around, like, you know, get the fuck away. And they're yelling at us. They're like, you're angry white man, this is our country, like, you know, and at one point I was like, you think I fucking want to be here too? Like, I don't want to be in this hell hole. It's hot as shit. <laughs> I want to go home too. Like, you know, as much as you don't want me here, I don't want to be here. So he's just getting closer and closer. And like all three, they're, they're like fucking around in their pockets. Like they're just yelling that we're angry white people and that this is their country. And like the closer they get, the sketchier it got. It was just like, damn, these dudes, like, you have no idea who people are. You know, you get briefed before you go. When we pulled up, you see that we're like 50 miles from the Iraq border. You know, like just because we're in Jordan doesn't mean there's not anything. You know, we get briefed, hey, possible ISIS cells, like all this kind of stuff, right? No one ever thinks anything of it though, because you're like, we're here to train. And these dudes are like walking up. And as they're like approaching you, it's like when kind of all those briefs like replay in your head. So you're like, oh shit, like these dudes, you don't know if these dudes are good people or if they're some bad dudes. 20 feet away, put my weapon on fire. I'm like, all right, like these guys are getting getting weird. They get closer and closer and they get like 10 feet away. Charge it, go condition one, throw my rifle up and I'm looking at this dude through my RCO and he just kind of like stops and is staring at me. And I'm like still yelling, I'm like get the fuck away, get the fuck away. It felt like forever that we were looking at each other. Like it felt like years that he was staring at me and I was looking at him. They just all three at the same time like turned around and they were like, go away, go away, like, and, and just left and then as they got in their truck and left, the that group of like 30 dudes kind of like slowly followed them away too. I was like, yeah, they were definitely like in charge of that group of people. There's definitely times when I'm like, you know, did I did I cross the line? Did I go too far? Did I do what I needed to? It's like one of those, you know, and obviously my section leader gave me some positive words of encouragement, you know, let me know like, hey, that was the right thing to do, good job. Like nothing, yeah. nothing wrong on your end. The ultimate goal was we were gonna do a live fire maneuver in our vehicles with people from each of those countries. So we were gonna have like soldiers from Jordan, Saudi Arabia and Italians like all in the back of a vehicle. 
and they were going to do like their own live fire maneuver, like how we would do with like the infantry. There was like a stint of like probably a month where we had two dudes. They would go around in the middle of the night and just walk up and you just get slapped across the fucking face while you're sleeping. And then they'd, they'd bolt, right? So like I have one night I'm sleeping and I just get fucking railed across my face. And I was like, I woke up and I was like, oh, what the? F-? And I'm like looking around and I don't see anyone. I'm like, did I just have a dream? Like, did I have a dream and I got hit in the face in my dream? And I was like, man, whatever. And like roll over, go about it. And then like two nights later, bro, I get drilled right here to the side. I wake up and I'm like, no one around. I'm like, dude, what the hell? Cause you always sleep with your curtains closed. So it gives you time, it gives them time. Cause they would just come in, like crack the curtain a little bit, get a hit on you and then run. By the time you're like up and moving your curtain, there's no one, you're not seeing anyone. The way I realized what was happening, cause one night it happened, I got hit across the face again. And uh, I popped up and I caught a dude running out of the birthing. And I was like, okay, I don't know who it is, but I know that this is happening now. And then I slowly began to like figure out who was doing it. But yeah, man, it's everything. The shaving cream shit, like, you know, shaving cream on the hand, tickle their nose, fucking in their palm. No, no one ever was really like, dude, fuck you. Like, yeah. we're going to fight now. Everyone's like, hey, it's all in good fun. When we would do anything together, it was a lot of time movies, like in the, in the birthing. Um, or if it wasn't that, it was like the little like tournaments or whatever they'd have going up in the, uh, in the mess deck. But most of the time those movies do, cause all of us had like a plethora of, of freaking movies, almost not enough time on deployment to watch all of them, but we had so many. So that was like our little, like our little thing for our birthing was one dude brought up, bought a, uh, brought a projector with him. So we'd hang up a sheet, put the projector on and fucking chill and watch movies. Love mid rats. The Navy hated us for eating mid rats. I went on pre-deployment leave and I got super chubby, insanely chubby. It was, it was really bad. And uh, I mean, you lose it pretty quick on a mew. Like it's always hot everywhere you go. So I lost it pretty quick, but it was like the servings at chow were horrible or the food was ass. So it's like, you were always going to mid rats. We actually brought a cook with us on deployment. So that way we didn't have to give up any Marines for ship tax. We didn't have to give up any Marines to go help anywhere. So we would go up with mid rats and even if they wouldn't serve us, like he'd hook it up, make fucking like egg sandwiches and shit for us. I was with my fiance at the time. We weren't married yet before I even had joined. And then, you know, she was with me through the whole workup cycle, through the deployment. And she had still lived on the East Coast. So we had had our separate lives, but we kind of had like a schedule that worked around each other. So coming back, it was it was a hard transition and weird transition everyone that you know, like family and everything develops their own life without you pretty much where you're gone. Now, if you go to like Okinawa or something like that, it's a little different. Like went to Okinawa for my second one. No one really, you know, you get to talk to everyone every day, but on ship, you know, we had one computer for 20 some dudes in a birthing. One conversation took like one week because I could email like a sentence to my wife and then I'd have to look the next day at her response because the time difference too. I was always receiving emails from family but I never had a chance all the time to write back to them. Mm. Uh, Cause at the time I was like, got to write back to my, my fiance. <laughs> like that was number one. They would send me letters all the time. I actually never wrote any letters home just because of the process of trying to like get it out and you know, wait until it gets there. And I told him like, before I left, I was like, Hey, my communication to you guys might be slim, but like, I'm going to get an email once I get on there. Like you guys can always send me mail. Like, I'll at least have that stuff from you guys, but just know like for me, there might not be much communication back. So they were kind of like already, they already knew like if they didn't get mail or anything for me, it wasn't any big deal. We actually have like a little like chip company back home and they do stuff for military all the time. So they ended up sending us like two huge boxes filled with like variety of their chips to me. So like we had two fucking huge boxes of chips in the squad bay or in the birthing, overwhelming amounts of letters. I had my birthday on ship. Uh, my mom ended up getting like any family or friends that knew me sent me letters. I had like a Ziploc bag just full of a stack of letters from them. So we'd go into like basically like blackouts pretty much. So they'd turn all the Wi-Fi and everything off. So it was like there'd be times where it's like days where the email wouldn't work. You get the email back up and then everyone's trying to swarm it. I never really wanted to uh, stress myself out with the email stuff. So I never really like sweated it. Uh, I let everyone else like 
fight over it and shit like that. Like all I ever asked for was like, hey, can I get on just to send an email or just read them? Like sometimes I would get on just to read the emails and then I'd hop off so other dudes could use them because I knew if I was on it too much, I was gonna get reliant on that. And like mentally, I knew I was gonna be like upset being gone. So it kind of helped out. I was like, I don't need to get on there. Like I don't want to as much. We had a sat phone that the uh, company first owner had that he would pass out every now and then. So like if you if you wanted to check on your family or whatnot, again, my section leader would always hook it up for us. Like pretty much like once a month, he'd get us a sat phone and we'd pass it through the section. So all of us would go out on the flight deck and then all take our freaking turns calling home. My wife at one point, I think even had like the sat phone number like saved in her phone. When I called the first time, she didn't answer. And I was like, fuck, like she's not gonna know this sat phone number. And uh, I called again and she answered and I was like, hey, hey, it's me, like, don't hang up, don't hang up. From then on, she like remembered that number. So anytime I called on it, it was like two rings, answered. Like it didn't matter where she was, sleeping, work, nothing, like it didn't matter. I'm an instructor right now at the schoolhouse. Okay. So I don't really have like anything like I would in the fleet. Yeah. But, like in the fleet, I'd be like a crew chief or like an assistant section leader. At the schoolhouse, we don't really have that because we just constantly have a flow of students coming through. So we just have like a couple instructors per team. But at the time coming back, uh, I got promoted on deployment. So I came back as a corporal. We had our three, our crew of three, uh, freaking uh, corporal reader, sergeant reader now. Uh, he got out though. Love that dude to death. Best NCO like I've ever had. Probably best mentor, leader that I had in the Marine Corps. Uh, he really hit on like the ways that I would pick things up and learn them. Uh, and then we had another dude, the Scala. And me and him were both like the rear crewman driver, but neither of us were like set in either position. It was more like, hey, do you want to drive today? Yeah, cool. Hey, I'll, hey, I'll drive tomorrow, like stuff like that. As a crew, uh, we got super tight coming back, stayed tight. But coming back, transitioning back into like family life was really weird. Again, because everyone gets their own own life going. And I don't blame anyone, uh, but a lot of people definitely don't, I don't think understand like, hey, when, I'm, when someone's coming back from deployment, whether it be a Marine, a soldier, airman, anything like that, like you kind of both have to like work into that transition. So it was hard. There was definitely some times that I felt like I was like working by myself. I told my family like when I left, like if anything bad happens in the family, like I don't want to know about it, like death, anything like that. Like unless it was one of my brothers or my mom or my dad, like I didn't want to know about it. So like I came back and had found out like my mom's mom, so my grandma had like almost died. Like I missed birthdays of my nieces, stuff like that. You just kind of come back and then start to reflect on all the things you missed. And you're like, damn, like this kind of sucks. At least in the Marine Corps, there's not, you don't get much downtime. <laughs> no matter what your MOS is, man, like you're not getting much downtime. So. You come back and then it's like you're you're right back into another cycle, whether it be a workup cycle or, or whatever it may be. You get that little bit of downtime where you reflect on all that stuff and then you're almost like forced to push past it, which is exactly like what happened pretty much. The biggest thing is transitioning back into each other's lives. Again, like my wife had had while I was gone on that on on the Mew, like she had her own life at that point for those seven months that we were gone because she had to. So it was like coming back and you're almost like trying to make your way back into their life. And then same thing with them, because you're on a deployment, like, you know, as shitty as it is, like, you got to push your home life to the back and put it on the back burner and then wait till you get back home to, to focus on home life again. So you're, you're both kind of like trying to work each other back into your lives. Yeah. So that was definitely where it got hard. They did like events for spouses. So where the spouses would come and like do stuff and meet up, just people that they can reach out to to talk to about it. That deployment, the family uh, readiness coordinator for three, five kind of focused more on like the infantry and their spouses. And then all the supporting units didn't get as much like attention from them. And I don't blame them because it's a busy job. You got how many Marines to take care of just in one company. They're in charge of like passing word for everything. So like, hey, your Marines are coming back this date at this time, right? Like they're in charge of all that. So like my wife wasn't getting like all that word all the time. So it was like me trying to like get an email out real quick of like, hey, this is what we're hearing right now. There's so many Facebook pages, groups of just spouses. Like the the support it, it, that they have is, is insane, but they definitely need it. Mm -hmm. It definitely goes unnoticed, I think, how much, how much they got to put into it too. The biggest change, man, is the, I think personally, just how much social media has affected everything. 
this younger generation coming in. When I joined, you know, obviously, like I told my recruiter, like, hey, I don't want to go infantry, but I want to be able to do something. I think that was the mentality of a lot of people. Like everyone wanted to join to do something. And they wanted to join the Marines to be the best and like to go, go do shit with the Marines. Now, it's like a lot more people are joining the Marine Corps to do college and nothing, nothing against them. You know, it's there and you have that benefit. Why not take advantage of it? Right. It's definitely having a big impact mentality wise and training wise of just like how the Marine Corps is. You know, the Marine Corps is always like, hey, we're the hardest motherfuckers around town. Like no one's going to beat us. But now you're getting people who don't want to do anything. They just they want to come and they want to get college. And, you know, they see social media of like, hey, I, you know, I don't have to listen to these people like I'm an adult too. And then it's one of those things where it's like, dude, like you're going to get someone killed because of your thinking like that. That's like the biggest, the biggest change. I mean, you can ask anyone in the Marine Corps now and 99% are probably all going to say the same thing. Social media has like, it, it, it's changed it drastically. I mean, and we had social media when I joined, like it wasn't like it was not made or invented. It just didn't have such an impact. I think because people are putting stuff out there, you kind of build like a different personality behind social media. There's a lot of entitlement. That's, that's a great word to put it, a lot of entitlement. And it's hard, man, because you see it, but it's just like, there's only so much you can do. And you just try to warn these, you know, these new Marines coming in, like, hey, don't, you know, don't let your pride get in the way. You know, don't let your past life before the Marine Corps get in your way. You know, this is a chance to, to have a new life, do something good, like take advantage of that and do it. The whole Marine Corps is in support of the infantry. Like, it doesn't matter what your job is. The main goal is to support the infantry. You know, you could be admin, you could be supply, like no matter what you're supporting them and no matter what you could be right beside them in the next big battle, you know, or big major war. I don't think a lot of people are like realize that. Especially now with like, you know, Afghanistan being done, all of that. A lot of people just think like peacetime is always gonna stay, I think. Just look back at history, history always repeats itself. A lot of the Marines that were in Kabul when we were pulling out of Afghanistan, I'm sure like a lot of those Marines probably didn't expect to be in Afghanistan ever. Like they probably were going on a mule like we were, where it was like, you know, we're just gonna hit Libo ports and train. And then boom, like that, you're there. It's hard because a lot of these kids are like so ingrained in their whatever lifestyle they had or mentality. You just got to do like what we call like daddy son talks, right? Like you got to kind of take the rank away and like talk to them like a, a man and be like, hey, look, like this is this is the harsh reality of it. Like you could wake up tomorrow and we could be in, an, in our next major conflict. The biggest example we use is, you know, our trackers that were going to Iraq when they did the initial push, you know, we had tracks there. And then when they did the second push in Iraq, we didn't have tracks, but all of our trackers were going as provisional infantry. So it's like, it doesn't matter what your MOS is. It doesn't matter what your job is. Like that next major conflict comes, like you you could be there and you just kind of have to sit them down and like make it a reality for them. Not like something they see through social media of like, oh, I just see videos of it. I'm never going to be there. You have to like tell them like, hey, you could be the next one in that, that, that video that you see on social media. The one guy you had had on here before, I'd brought that example up and told him at work of the freaking, the skin dog mm -hmm. that he saw, mm -hmm. you know, and I told him like, <laughs> you know, he, he may have known he was going to war, but like, you don't expect to see that. You may not expect something, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. You have no control over that. Just thanks again for having me here, man. It's an awesome experience. Glad I was able to come and kind of, kind of still talk about, you know, what it what it's like being in a little bit. The Marine Corps will 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 give back to you. Be motivated. Be ready to go. Like wanting to do it. You know, like I always tell people, if you, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. If you have to second guess it, then it's not for you. All right. If you have to think twice, you should probably you should probably just say no. But if you if you think about it and you're like, that's what I want to do, do it. Full steam ahead into that. And, and the Marine Corps will, will, will give back to you and you will get what you want from it, 100%.